Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we are so keenly aware on a larger weekend like this of the untold diversity of spiritual condition in this room. There are those that are so anxious about their health, they wonder if they will live out the year. There are those that are burdened and almost weighed down unbearably by the physical and mental restraints that are on them. There are those that are angry, and bitter, and scarcely able to talk to people. There are those that are ecstatic with joy on Easter weekend. There are those that are dry and spiritually barren and dead and long to believe and can't. There are the cocky who were drugged here by some relative who wish they weren't here. They're quite happy with their lifestyle. They don't want to mess it up with religion. Lord, there's just so much diversity. What can I do? I couldn't begin to touch every need here in myself. And so I'm looking away to the story of the five loaves and two fish. 5,000 people to be fed and a tiny little lunch. And I pray that you would take this imperfect effort of mine to bear witness to the risen Christ and multiply it miraculously so that people with exactly opposite needs would be confronted by the risen Savior in a healing, saving way. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. When I was in college, that's over 40 years ago, I graduated in 1968. The question was more prominent and more intense than it is today as to whether Jesus Christ rose historically and bodily from the dead. There was still, it was, it was starting to fade away because of the rise of existentialism. We thought that was cool in those days. It was, it was still holding sway that such questions mattered. And if he did, it would shake you. And if he didn't, it would shake you. And you took a stand. If he did and you believed it, it would change your life. And you'd stake it and you'd name yourself a Christian. You'd believe the rest of the Bible and made a difference. And if he didn't, and you thought he didn't, you said so, you didn't call yourself a Christian, and you were courageously unbelieving. That's just kind of the way it was. Today, it's, it's a little different. The question, historically, did it happen? Was it bodily? Isn't the main question. The main question is, so what? Do I care? Would it make any difference to me? Some people believe one thing, and some people believe another thing, and if, if you believe that and it gives you some help to live a, a flourishing, full life, bless you. I, just don't get, don't pressure anyone else to believe because if I don't think it's the case, then, then that's my choice. Now, behind these two kinds of unbelief, the one 40 years ago and the one now, are different assumptions. Let me see if I can describe a little bit of them to you. 
Uh, the assumption 40 years ago was more or less like this. There are natural laws in the world. They make the universe understandable, life understandable. They make science possible. And these laws make it simply untenable that there could be such a thing as a miracle like a resurrection from the dead. You, you, the world would be so at loose ends and science would be so impossible if we thought that any test tube might produce some weird miracle. Nothing would be possible. You, you cannot in the modern world believe that sort of thing. That was my day. Now the assumption today is not quite like that. It's not there are external laws outside of me that define what can get through to me and shape me and, and determine me. There is a law in here today. And the law in here says, I will admit in here what I like. If I feel that it will make my life better or flourishing or happier, then I'll admit it. And if it won't, I won't. And right here is where the line is drawn, not out there. Now those are two very, very different assumptions about how to process what is coming at you in the world. There's always reality coming at you. And you can think of it as, I got to have a grid that objectively helps me decide what is so that I can know what I will let shape me by some external criteria, or I'm just going to be the criteria and I will admit what I feel like admitting. And you can admit what you feel like admitting. Well, just get along. If you want to believe in a resurrection from the dead and it helps you, great. Leave me alone and I will decide just what kinds of things get through to me. For the, for the contemporary mindset, a thought about Jesus rising from the dead is more or less in the category of a UFO or possibility of a life on a planet in a distant galaxy. Maybe so. Maybe so. It's just not relevant. I don't, I don't waste any time. Just don't think about it. My life just goes on. I don't think about UFOs. I don't think about life on another planet. They can send that rocket out there to find out in five or six years whether they can find anything green out there, but I'm not thinking about it. Very different kind of mindset. My purpose in bringing all that up is this. As I present you with a witness to the resurrection of Jesus, I simply want to raise the awareness of your brain and how, how it's functioning. So that you will not be like a leaf, kind of floating around on the ocean of current trends, like blow this way, blow that way, but you will be thinking now, okay, what grid will I use when he starts talking about this stuff? Will I go the modern route from 40 years ago where you have natural laws that says such things don't happen? We're scientific, good grief, we're enlightenment people. We are post-scientific. We're not Old-fashioned. Will, will you go that route, or, or will you be post-modern instead of modern and, and say, I've got a law in here, and my law says what is, is what I want to be, and I will admit it if it seems like it's going to be helpful. I just want you to think about how are you going to admit this or not? Because if you think about it, you just might take it seriously. You might ask, could this really matter? Would the possibility of a historical event like this change something possibly for me? That's the reason for bringing all that up. Now, I'm going to get to John 20 eventually, but I'm going to go in an indirect way, and you don't have to look these other texts up. You can just listen. 
I want to start with a sermon preached by the Apostle Paul to a bunch of philosopher lovers on Mars Hill in Athens about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, okay? He was preaching this sermon, and he ended it like this. In fact, he didn't want to end it like this. They cut him off. So let me read you what he was saying when the philosopher lovers cut him off and mocked him. So here's what he was saying. This is Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. The times of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance by raising him from the dead. And they cut him off. They thought that was ludicrous. It says they mocked him because of the word that he spoke concerning the resurrection of the dead, which is very significant in and of itself because it meant this Christian movement was not spreading through the urban centers of the ancient world because those people were so blame gullible. (laughs) They were just as skeptical as you modern scientific, postmodern, self-centered moderns are. We are like them and they are like us. It wasn't spreading like that. It was spreading because something else was going on. Now notice what Paul says. He says the whole world must repent. Everybody must repent because everybody sinned. That's the assumption behind this sermon. It's the assumption behind the Christian religion is that every human being feels inadequate because they are inadequate. Because we've sinned against God. We've sinned against our own conscience. Everybody has a conscience that troubles them from time to time at least. Late at night, early in the morning, when you're sober. And therefore everybody needs to repent. Something has to happen We're out of sync with God. We all know we are. Feel it in our bones. We know God. We know we've fallen short. And we need a Savior. And he says, everybody must repent. It's very urgent. And the reason it's urgent, he says, is because God is going to judge the whole world. And then he adds these amazing words. He's going to judge the world by a man. It's like God says, okay, I'm not going to judge you. A man is going to judge you. And of this, of this, that a man will judge, namely Jesus, God gives assurance, it says, by raising him from the dead. Now, think about the implications of that. Just just think about it from God's side according to this testimony. What that says is, In God's way of reaching the world with the news about salvation through Jesus in advance of the judgment of Jesus, the way this works is that God assures the world that there's going to be a judgment by raising Jesus from the dead, which means he must think the world has a way to be assured of this. You don't have to guess. If you had to guess, this wouldn't work. This makes no sense. If you say, I don't know whether he rose from the dead. If he left you like that, this wouldn't work. He didn't leave you like that. You're in this room. Not by accident. Now, The way it works is that God raised Jesus from the dead and saw to it that there were eyewitnesses. And they were unbelievably skeptical. Even the women were skeptical, I'll show you in a minute, at first. No way, this doesn't happen. Just like modern people. 
And then for 40 days with many infallible proofs, Luke tells us, he's kind of a historian in the crowd, he validated his bodily historical resurrection and then he went back to heaven and said, I'm coming back again and the next time I come, I'm coming as judge. Spread this to the world as witnesses to the resurrection. Let me give you another example of that from Peter's message. Um, Peter was another apostle and he said about eight years, maybe 10, after the resurrection in a sermon preached to a bunch of uh, Gentiles, one of them Cornelius, you know this, in Acts chapter 10, he said this, God raised Jesus on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us whom he had chosen, whom God had chosen as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So you get God's design now. God's design neither then nor now, neither right after the resurrection nor now is that everybody see him. Intentionally, a small group were chosen, you see me, you witness, everybody else believes through your witness. That's the way he gives assurance to the world. Oh, I'd love to talk more about the dynamics. This is, there's two big scholarly books written on, on the New Testament as eyewitnesses. There's a lot of people thinking about that these days, about the eyewitness nature and how, how wit philosophers are thinking about this these days, about how you decide upon truth of something you haven't seen. No video, no photographs, no recorders, a claim that it happened that really matters in your life. Somebody's dead or alive. Some disease is coming. Some terrorist is after you. Is it true? How will you decide? And all you've got to witness. A lot of people are thinking about that these days because your life, your life hangs on how you validate a witness. God did not leave the assurance that Jesus rose from the dead to a video a fickle, concocted video. He left it to eyewitnesses who would write down their testimony. And that's what we have in John 20. John's eyewitness account. That's what we have in Matthew 28, Matthew's eyewitness account. That's what we have in Luke 24, though Luke himself was not an eyewitness of the resurrection. He hung out with Paul most of his ministry life. And when he was in Caesarea in Jerusalem, he spent two years doing research, talking to people like Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's what we have in Mark 16. <laughs> I think it's right, probably, that Mark was that naked guy who ran away, who left his clothes behind. Can't prove that. But he hung out with Peter. His house was in Jerusalem. He probably saw it all. That's what we have in Pre Peter, Second Peter. We saw his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. The New Testament is eyewitness accounts or people that are real close to the eyewitnesses telling their varied, mutually confirming testimonies. And that's what we have here in John. If you want to open your Bibles now, here we are. We finally made it, John 20. Let me show you something in front of John 20 and something behind John 20, just so you feel how John fits into this divinely designed purpose that he not leave the world without a warrant for faith in the risen Christ. Chapter 19, verse 35. Right in the middle of the crucifixion, John breaks off and he says this, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth that you may believe. Now, whether you believe that or not, that's what he thinks should be enough for you to believe. If, if, if I saw a person killed or raised, 
and I came to you and I said, I saw it. It happened. There would be ways for you to decide, shall I believe John Piper? Chapter 21, verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things and we know that his testimony is true. So the conception of the Gospel of John is we have an eyewitness, he has borne this witness, it's being recorded and written down and preserved so that you may read it 20 centuries later and decide Will I credit this testimony? My life hangs on it. Well, chapter 20. Let's listen to his witness. There's so much here, and of course, we'll just get a little bit from it. And I hope my choices are appointed by the Lord for you. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, so the first, first person to arrive, these women were amazingly courageous. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Mary did not believe in the resurrection. They've stolen or taken the body. This is not a gullible woman. She's skeptical. Didn't it? The stone is gone, solution? Somebody took the body. Mary, he said he was going to rise. That's the way they were, men and women. Peter and the other disciple, doesn't name him, it's probably John, the writer. Peter and John run to the tomb when she tells them that the stone is moved and somebody's taken the body. They run to the tomb and and John outran Peter. I used to joke with my cousin Peter about that. <laughs> and then he always got me with the next one about, yeah, but Peter had the courage to go in. <laughs> so you want to be fast or you want to be courageous? Verse 5, stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. That's what Jesus' body had been wrapped in, according to chapter 19, verse 40. They wrapped him in these linen cloths, so you wrap him with lots, like 75 pounds of uh, spices that Nicodemus brought. Bless him. Peter comes. John's down there peeking in. Evidently enough light by now to see. He's peeking in. He can see something. There's, the claws are there. He's not making anything of it. Verse 6. Simon Peter came following him and went in to the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Very odd way for thieves to behold, to behave. We, no. I don't think so. What does John uh, want us to learn here? What do you conclude from, from this? Uh, two things. Let me give you two things. Number one, Jesus rose bodily, not just spiritually, from the dead. <laughs> I studied theology in Germany and uh, was burdensome to read scholars talk about, oh, yes, we believe in the resurrection. The Spirit of Christ is alive in the world. His influence goes on mightily forth. 
Of course, you, you could wheel his body in with a wheelbarrow if you could find it. Very sad. That's the opposite of the point of John. The body's gone. Now get this. This among a dozen other arguments that I won't talk about. This message of the risen Christ was unbelievably dangerous and opposed in, <clears throat> in, in Jerusalem for weeks and months and years. And oh, how they would have loved to produce the body. And they couldn't. The empty tomb is a loud witness to the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Second observation. This linen stuff means, I think, that his body is physical because it's not there, but it's not like the body that died. It's the same and it's not the same, which matters for you because according to the rest of the New Testament, you will one day in Christ have a body like his resurrection body. So listen for a minute. This matters to you. Some of you are heading for this sooner than others. Christ, the first fruits, Paul said, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So the big issue is, do you belong to him? Through faith in him, embracing his Savior and Lord and treasure of your life, do you belong to Christ? If you do, then when he comes, you get a body like his body, and this poor, wasting away body will be radically changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we shall be changed. The reason the linen cloths are a big deal is because of, I think, Lazarus. This is an intentional contrast with chapter 11. Lazarus had been dead four days. He stunk, his sister said. And Jesus said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Remove the stone. Lazarus, come forth. How does he come forth explicitly? Bound with linen cloths and a face cloth. Exact same word, around his head. He couldn't get out. Somebody had to unbind him. Why? His body was still mortal. Poor Lazarus was going to die a second time. The only person in the history of the world. Well, that's not true. I suppose there were a couple of others that Jesus raised from the dead. You had to die twice. But Jesus, the linen claws are just there, neatly folded off to the side. The point of John, as he tells this story, is he didn't have a body like Lazarus's. And if you look at verse 19 and verse 26 in chapter 20, this body is just showing up through locked doors. It goes through linen cloths and it goes through locked doors. Verse 26, chapter 20, verse 26. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Now, you would think, okay, we're dealing with a ghost here. This is a ghost. This is just kind of a, God can do holograms. No, because in that very moment, Jesus said what to Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Non-gullible, skeptical, I'll not believe until I put my finger in his side, Thomas. He said, Thomas, 
This is verse 27. Put your finger here in my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. It's a physical body. Luke, (laughs) in his testimony, said, A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. He said, don't call me a ghost. You got anything to eat? Give me a fish. I love that. Give me a fish. And he eats it. He eats the fish right in front of him. The point is, that's the kind of body you'll have. You don't have to like fish. I don't like fish. (laughs) I think heaven, you'll get what you like. Or your likes will be changed and you'll get what you like. Now, if you say, okay, nice story, it just doesn't matter to me. It's like whether there's life on another galaxy and those UFOs, I just, this doesn't matter to me. Philippians 3.21 says, Paul talking, who saw the Lord on the Damascus Road. Jesus will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subdue everything to himself. That's not a UFO. That's not irrelevant to you. Whether you get that body or have your present one thrown into outer darkness matters to you. It's a choice you got to make. The question is, do you belong to him? Because if you belong to him, you'll get a body like his and live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And if you don't belong to him, you won't enter in. So what's the issue as we close? The issue is, do you, do you see it, the resurrection? Him glorious. Look at verse 8. Then the other disciple, John, finally John comes in, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. What do you see? Jesus wasn't there. He saw evidence. He saw some witness left behind by Jesus. He saw enough. And he believed. That's one kind of seeing. Seeing that doesn't have Jesus there to see. That's the way we see. What about Mary? Verse 18 She's met Jesus. She recognized him, Rabboni. He says, don't, don't grab me. I've got work to do here. Then I'm leaving. You can't, I'm not going to stay with you. It's not like what you think. I'm not starting the kingdom yet. I'm going to go away, so still, don't, don't cleave to me. Like. And, and then she ran, and she tell the other disciples, verse 18, I have seen the Lord. You don't get that like that. You get it like John. Not like that. So let me close with a story I made up, an analogy, an illustration. What I'm after here is I'm trying to help you somehow, by God's grace, oh Lord, help me, help you experience John's seeing and believing. That's what I'm trying as we close. So here's, here's the illustration. Later today, you're at home and there's this pounding on the door. And you open the door and a friend of yours looks very distraught and says, can I come in? I need to talk to you. He says, sure. Let's sit down. He says, I've got really bad news. I've been through this one time in my life. I've got really bad news. What is it? 
your brother, Jim, he's dead. And you look at him and you say, I just was with him this morning. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And your friend says, we went to the game together. And when we were coming out, you were walking down in this car. It just went out of control and swerved up on the, on the sidewalk. And I knelt down right beside him. I stayed there till the medical examiner came. I held him. He's dead. And you say, I see. I see. Now I want to ask you, what do you mean by that? I see. What do you mean? Here's what you mean. You mean a witness has become a window. You see right through the witness to the reality. And there's no doubt in your mind, your brother is dead. So we see like John saw, not like Mary. The witness of the empty tomb and the testimony of the linen cloths and of those who later saw him become for us a window onto reality. Only here's the difference. Jesus is alive instead of dead. It's as though a second friend <laughs> opened the door. He's not dead. I don't know what to say, but your brother is not dead. He's alive. He came back. That's, it's more like that. Oh God, grant, I pray, that you would have eyes to see. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, open our eyes that we might see. You, you do mean to give the world a warrant that you will one day judge the world by a man, Christ Jesus. And of this you have given assurance by raising him from the dead and by supplying ample testimony in the New Testament to his reality. Oh, make us see. Remove every obstacle of our hearts and our minds so that the glory of the risen Christ would be self-authenticatingly manifest behind the window of the witness of the Word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.